Help support AMTV by becoming a patron, an AMTV staff member, and following us over on Twitter. Hi there guys, it's Adam Martin here, and welcome back to another video. And today I wanted to talk about the state of children's TV, because I actually think it's a really important topic for the television industry going forward, particularly here in the UK. Now, you know from this channel, if you've been watching for a while, that... You know, we've covered things like CITV recently, the fact that that channel is now shut down in its uh, mainstream traditional TV form. That's all gone online, etc, etc. But this, this topic today I wanted to talk about is a bit wider, a bit deeper than that. Now, I saw this. This is an article posted by Sky News, who, of course, it must be said, launched their own kids channel earlier this year, Sky Kids. We did an ident review on those idents, which are quite interesting. But... I wanted to see what they had to say here. It features a lot of the uh, contributions from Connie Hook, who was most known as a Blue Peter presenter, particularly during my childhood, so it'll be interesting to see her thoughts on it. But the title is, Kids TV as we know it is dying. Is the explosion of choice replacing it too much for our children? So that's what we're going to delve into today. But before we do, if you're new here, hello. Please do like the video, subscribe. We do videos talking about TV, TV history, new things happening in TV, and a lot more subjects than just television as well. You can find that on this channel. So join us, subscribe. Okay, now let's get into it. It says, CITV, the channel that gave us Fraggle Rock, Danger Mouse, and Rainbow, has left our terrestrial screens. CBBC, home of Blue Peter and Newsround, plans to follow. Meanwhile, real-term investment in children's TV by public service broadcasters, so that's like the BBC, ITV, etc., has dropped by 30% in the last 10 years. And whilst Sky has booked the trend by launching an ad-free channel for kids, overall, the future of kids' TV is looking bleak. I love that, you know, Sky's patting itself on the back, like, well done, guys. We're, we're the new bastions of kids' TV. And to be fair, you know, as mentioned, this is an ad-free channel, which for Sky is, quite, well, quite a rarity, considering they, they like money, like most broadcasters do. But it's ad-free, it's 24 hours, and it shows, you know, exclusively content for kids. And I think having a channel like that, or in that sort of vein, is certainly a good idea to, to hold on to. So, you know, fair play to Sky for patting itself on the back there. But why why is it painting this bleak picture? It says, figures show young people are still watching TV, but in a different way. Recent bar viewing data shows that while the average amount of broadcast TV minutes of children's TV channels watched by four-year-olds per week has declined by 62% since 2019, viewing has actually risen by 30% in the same period, demonstrating the streaming thirst trend in children's viewing habits. We touched on this in the CITV video not too long ago, but it's making this argument that children, particularly younger children, uh, are still watching television, but more streaming first. So they're getting their content via BBC iPlayer, via ITVX Kids now, via... Um, Disney Plus via Netflix, etc. So traditional TV, you know, coming home from school, sitting down in front of the telly and watching programs as they go out live, that seems to be in a sharp decline just from 2019. But I mean, back when I was growing up in the early 2000s, you know, the internet was still a thing. Sure, it wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. But for me, like coming home from school, that was a ritual to, you know, get home, get in front of the telly and from like, I don't know, four o'clock to 5.30, that was my time to watch programs. That was kids programming at its finest. And that trend seems to not be as... Um, not be as commonplace anymore amongst kids. It says, so if kids are ditching linear viewing in favor of streaming, some might say that public service broadcasters moving their content online makes sense. Others would rightly argue that not all children have access to the internet. And this is actually a big talking point. It sort of ties into the new service Freely that's going to be coming out next year. And again, I did a video covering that. You know, the idea that the public service broadcasters, BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5, they're going to all club together to launch this new service. It's going to be built into smart TVs. It's going to ultimately replace Freeview, not initially, but will ultimately replace Freeview. You know, you won't have to have an aerial. It will all be done over the internet. But and it may seem like a broken record, but th there is this point, you know, not all children or families even have access to the internet. I know a few of you commented on the Freely videos saying, oh, well, you know, you don't actually need that strong of a bandwidth to stream uh, programs in 1080p. And I guess with kids content, some would argue, well, you know, would kids notice if content's in 720p, 480? That's a debate for another time. But, you know, sure, you might not need a strong bandwidth to stream it, but if you're already relying on, say, not the strongest bandwidth internet, okay, using that to watch TV, but then what if one of the parents needs to use the internet on their phone or their laptop or computer or someone else in the house is using it? It's just, you know, kids with limited internet or no internet at all will be, they'd be completely at loss if all TV goes online. And to be honest, you know, some might say, oh, well, you know, Sky Kids is here. That's, you know, that's out there. But lest we forget, to access Sky Kids, you need a Sky package, right? Unless it, is it free to air? 
No, you see, Sky Kids is a paid-for add-on available with Sky TV as part of the Now TV Entertainment membership. So it can, comes with eight channels containing hours of live and on-demand entertainment for primary age children. So even though Sky Kids is saying, oh yeah, but you know, we're ad-free, we run 24 hours, we show content just for kids, you still gotta pay for it. Not exactly free. Continuing on then with this article, it says there's the question of what kids are actually watching online. It's an explosion of choice that the longest serving female presenter of Blue Peter, Connie Hook, doesn't think is necessarily a good thing. Hook tells Sky News, kids will always go for the biggest, fastest dopamine hit. We live in a world of instant gratification culture and actually delayed gratification is much better for happiness and mental well-being in the long term. And kids, obviously, they're not old enough to always make the right judgment calls. I think that's a fair assessment. You know, I'd argue that's that's not being patronizing to kids. It's just, it's the way things are. You know, you've got things like TikTok, for example, these short videos which kids can swipe through endlessly and endlessly and endlessly. And it's just this instant dopamine hit, whether it's showing a meme or like the latest viral trend or things like that. It's, it is, it's like Connie says, it's a very quick dopamine hit. You know, go back 20 years when I was a primary age kid, it was that thing of, you know, you had CBBC, you had CITV, you'd still be able to watch programs, but it was that delayed gratification. You'd watch a program over time. Episodes of a program would often be 25 to 30 minutes. Never, you know, you had some shorter programs, sure, that were like five to 10 minutes, but you'd have to watch programs longer to get that gratification from them. And it was worth it. Yeah, when I was a kid, things like YouTube existed, but, you know, YouTube was very much in its infancy when I was a kid, and it didn't quite have the same state as it does now, and we were a long way off things like, well, Vine first, and then TikTok, or any of that. Hook, who is a mother of two herself and now works as a children's author and screenwriter, recognises the need for government legislation to hold streaming companies to account for the content they're putting out, but she also recognises the limitations of people trying to control a seemingly infinite web. She says, it's hard for laws, legislation, parents, schools, and the control culture to keep up with the changes that are going on, so it's important to make sure that you know that your kid, what your kid is seeing. Because on YouTube, for instance, your child could be watching one thing, but then different suggestions pop up unselected, unbeknownst to you, so a few programs hop away could be something that you might not be comfy with your child watching. And yeah, this has been a debate on YouTube for so long now. I mean, it makes me think all the way back to the... Do you remember the Elsagate scandal of like 2016, 17? There were those videos of like adults dressing up as Elsa and Spider-Man and then actually doing weird things or things that weren't necessarily appropriate for a child audience. That's always been the problem with YouTube. I know YouTube Kids is a thing and that's tailor-made for kids' content, but that system's been abused before. What's to stop it being abused again? And also, you know, kids are savvy. They're increasingly tech-savvy. I mean, they live in an age where technology is so common that, you know, things like parental controls, uh, some kids could probably bypass that. I do think a lot of the responsibility does fall on the parent, not to always be watching 24-7, but like Connie Hook says, just to sort of keep in touch, just to keep checking what they're seeing, you know, like check YouTube, uh, search history every now and then and things like that or, or you know try and be up front with your child and ask what they're watching I'm not saying that children shouldn't be able to watch things like YouTube or TikTok or anything like that But I do think you know without any sort of regulation from parents or in a sense some uh, Interference from higher up, you know, it's just gonna run amok really But then it's true trying to control an infinite web the the internet is essentially infinite You know, it's growing all the time it would be impossible to fully regulate that without it coming across as very, like, authoritarian and all this sort of stuff. So there is there is a fine line somewhere, but maybe just very difficult to reach. The Online Safety Bill, a new set of laws to protect children and adults online, is due to come into force later this year. At the Royal Television Society convention earlier this week, Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser announced new plans to bring unregulated online channels under Ofcom content rules on traditional TV to ensure children and vulnerable viewers are protected from inappropriate or harmful material. Yeah, this has been talked about a lot, how things that are airing on traditional TV need to be brought into line with Ofcom, like have those same set of rules, those same set of regulations, and I, do, I don't necessarily disagree with that. The Department for Culture, Media and Sport told Sky, the shows we watch as children shape the way we see the world, staying with us forever. Wow, the one bit of sense from that department in the last few years. From Thomas the Tank Engine to Shaun the Sheep and Horrible Histories, the UK is home to some of the world's best children's shows. Again, I absolutely agree. Over 845 kids' programs have benefited from the government's generous animation and children's tax reliefs, increased in this year's budget, leading to more than a billion pounds of investment. The upcoming media bill will require mainstream on-demand streaming services to follow a new video on-demand code, protecting children from harmful or inappropriate content, and we're consulting on bringing unregulated 
rated online TV channels under Ofcom's rules to deliver constant protection. So, you know, it seems the you'd like to think the efforts there from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport to really try and enforce these new regulations to truly try and offer those more protections for children and families in the online and TV space. We'll just have to see in the future how well that's done. However, with investment in kids' TV at its lowest level since 2012, with some research report finding that it went from 114 million in 2013 to just 80 million in 2022. I say just, that's still a huge amount, but that is a big drop with those numbers. Many would argue that investment is just not enough. Spending on original kids' content in the UK has been slashed following the 2006 ban on advertising junk food to children. Now, this was a definitely a two-edged sword. Whilst I did agree with banning advertising junk food to kids because that is, you know, that could potentially harmful. That could and did lead to a lot of health problems. You know, if kids are just seeing junk food being advertised as, hey, you should have this, you know, regularly on the daily in some cases. I remember seeing adverts for junk food all the time when I was a kid. This was pre-2006, obviously. But then I guess, you know, advertisers want to spend money on kids' TV on these channels. It helps them generate revenue. If they're not going to spend there, then that's definitely a revenue cut. I think ultimately it was the right decision, but, you know, it does pose a revenue issue in some cases for some channels. The Young Audience's Content Fund, which is a £44 million fund designed to help support children's programming on channels like ITV and Channel 5, that was scrapped by the government last year. Former CBB series producer John Hancock, who's now managing director of kids and family production company Three Arrows Media, calls the ditching of the fund a difficult pill to swallow, particularly because it was such a monumental success. It was set up by the government and administrated by the BFI. The fund was created to help stimulate more commissioning of UK-specific content in public service broadcasters outside of the Beeb, which of course is funded by its license fee. The producer says that the fund helped the likes of Channel 5 commission some fantastic award-winning content, and to have that scrapped as it was 18 months ago was a devastating blow to the kids' industry. So, you know, even things that are designed to help children's TV, they're being, they're being cut for, well, seem uh, who knows, like whether it's money-saving or maybe like they think it's not... As worthwhile an investment anymore but you know all these people talk about oh how kids tv in the uk is so important we're such groundbreakers we led the way as it were and yet we're not supporting that industry still it's a great shame hook 2 also says the loss of original sometimes boundary pushing content is a blow to british children's viewing kids program has often been at the head of the curve before grown-up programming has even caught up with it such as diversity stuff like gay rights and it's true it really is true pushing diversity acceptance uh, rights for all kinds of people that has been present in kids tv or at least been featured in kids tv in many cases long before shows for adults and i think that is an important thing that does need to continue as we as we go forward so then the final round of the article touches on uh, CBBC specifically in the future. So it mentions that the BBC's plans to stop terrestrial broadcasting of its kids' channel, CBBC, home to shows like Blue Peter and Newsround. In the future, Hook feels that the broadcaster could be missing a trick. So Connie says there's less and less of these shared viewing experiences, which is why I think some of these Pixar films do so well these days, in that tea time viewing isn't really a thing, and everyone seems to just be watching their own thing on their own device. There's no family viewing as such. And I think that largely has happened, and that is a that is a great shame amongst children and adults you know that that old tradition that was there for decades of right you know at five or six o'clock we'll all gather in the front room and we'll watch a program on tv whether that was a children's program or a, a more mainstream program for all ages you know that doesn't happen nowhere near as much anymore and you know it is such a shame but it is it's the reality of how things have gone most people most families including the children have their own device whether that's an ipad a phone uh well a games console you could argue you know it's just it's just not, it's not there anymore. And to, to get that back, I, I'm not sure really if, if that is possible at this point. It's, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I know there are families that still watch TV together and that's great, but I think it's nowhere near as widespread as it once was. The BBC told Sky News, we have said we won't close any of our children's channels before 2025 at the earliest, and we will maintain them for as long as they deliver value and our audience needs them. Children's content is a priority for the BBC and we are the major investor of original, culturally relevant British content for ages 0 to 12, more than any other streamer or broadcaster in the UK, and we still have the two leading linear channels for them. That's technically true at the minute, you know, CBBC and CBBS are still operating, they are the leaders in that field. Again, they mentioned that CBBC might close at 2025 at the earliest, although it does say we will maintain them for as long as they deliver value and our audience needs them. 
Um, you know, value, that's, you could argue that's more business sense. Is it generating enough? But, you know, as long as the audience needs them, I'd argue that should be the core principle the BBC's leading when it comes to kids' content. There will always be some kids, at least at the present, who will need CBBC. Those kids who don't have access to strong internet. Those children whose families can't afford streaming plans. Those uh, children whose families can't afford a Sky package. You know, all these things. Uh, th and, you know, the license fee does come into it. That is... That is a payment, as we've established several times on this channel, and as so many of you like to keep reminding me. But in terms of, like, the reach, CBBC, I'd argue, out of all of the main children's channels, still has the biggest reach. CBB seemingly is protected, which I think is the right call, because, you know, preschool kids or kids that CBB's targets, you'd argue they're not really inclined to go to, like, the streamers or anything like that. So having a channel, a linear channel, that is just accessible for parents and those age groups right there and then, I think that's the right call going forward, and hopefully it'll stay that way. Maybe CBBC might have a reprieve in 2025, maybe it'll stick around on linear TV longer. We'll just have to see what the state of play is at that time. The article concludes with, So while Bob the Builder and Horrid Henry have been forcibly evicted from their CITV terrestrial home and plonked onto ITVX Kids, Blue Peter at least has a temporary reprieve and won't be setting sail for online quite yet. Keep in mind, Blue Peter's been going since 1958. 65 years! Time will tell if the evolution of kids' TV to online will crush its creative spark, or whether the challenge of standing out in a crowded marketplace will inspire innovative new shows and approaches, a new golden age as such for children's TV. But as the kids become the curators of their own content, the good, bad and ugly, might we do well to consider whether we're handing over too much responsibility to our youngest and arguably most important viewers to consume whatever, wherever and whenever they want? It's a good question. And I think there's arguments for both. You know, there's always been the debate in TV long before, uh, you know, online came on. The program makers were making stuff that really, you know, they had testing groups and such, but they had no idea whether the children en masse would enjoy them or not. You know, it was always a bit of a big risk. Some shows would take off straight away. Some shows would take off later on. And some shows would just not take off at all. You know, you were always being offered as a kid, here's what we think you'll enjoy. And you might enjoy it, you might not. You might take a while to get into it. Whereas now, with things like, you know, YouTube, TikTok, the streamers, more and more, it's like, here's everything you pick. You know, all this is being... And then the minute the child sort of registers an interest in one thing, you know, on an individual basis, mind you, we're not talking everybody, we're talking on an individual basis, things like YouTube and TikTok can go, oh, right, you like this? Well, how about this? And, you know, hopefully, when the system works, it works positively, but it can be abused, it can be manipulated, and that can have a, a damaging or negative effect on that particular young viewer. I think there is scope, you know, if kids TV does eventually go fully online. Say 10 years down the line, there's no linear TV channels for kids anymore, it's all online. I think there is potential for it to have, in, like, have this new golden age, as it says, you know, innovate these new shows and approaches. I just think that's going to be so difficult, though, when you're competing with YouTube, TikTok, all these apps, all these streams that already have such a wealth of content, you know, for things like CBBC and CITV, you know, they're no names, and to move them online, you know, like CBBC, for example, people are going to know that, but how many kids are going to go to the CBBC website specifically, as opposed to have just had it online? I just think the this new golden age of kids TV, I don't want to say it's impossible, but I'd argue the odds are severely stacked against it, especially if we go all online. Just a little editor's note, as I didn't include this in my original filming, but I'm well aware there's more than just like CBBC and CITV. For example, you've got the American companies like Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Boomerang, and then there's things like Pop, Tiny Pop, etc., which I think have recently come on Freeview, which I think is a good thing. So, you know, if CBBC does go online, you might think, oh, well, you know, maybe all that viewership will go over to something like Pop, and yeah, it might do for the time being, but you got to remember, all those ones are funded by advertisers, and it comes into play, like we said, when they banned the junk food thing back in 2006. That was a that was a big step, and I think things like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, you know, they'll probably go on, but I believe you can only still access them through, you know, paid packages with your provider, whether that's Virgin or Sky, so that's another upfront cost. Whilst Pop is on Freeview again, I believe, which is good, um, that was always or always seemingly a bit of a like smaller operation, so I'm not sure how long that would last on if CBBC disappeared. I know it's not by the same company, but I mean, it's all to play for. None of us really know. I'd argue these other, these other competitors like Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Pop, etc., 
I mean, they've seen a decline recently anyway, particularly with like traditional TV viewers. So if, you know, CITV and CBBC may be the first ones to move online, but it wouldn't surprise me within, say, the next 10 years if Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, all of those weren't particularly too far behind. And, you know, if these regulations come in, I do hope they can filter out the stuff that is just like totally inappropriate for a child audience. I mean, I'm not a parent myself, but I'd like to think if I was a parent that I'd want to make sure what my child was watching was definitely appropriate at the very least. Varied, absolutely. I mean, the stuff I watched as a kid was very varied, but it was always appropriate. I guess that was the one advantage of linear TV. The broadcasters could review the programs coming in, make sure they were appropriate before screening them. Whereas with online at the moment, there's less of that review process, less of that safeguard. Yes, I know, like they say, YouTube and TikTok are meant to review these things, but we've seen so many occasions where that's all slipped through the cla uh, through the cracks. I mean, the Elsa Gate stuff on YouTube being the prime example. So, is children's TV dead? In a linear sense, not at the moment. But again, as I've said with different things, within the next 10 years, it's sadly looking likely. But is children's TV dead on the whole? No, I think there'll always be children's TV in some form, whether that's online or via a paid subscription, which, you know, might not be ideal, but I think children's TV will endure and survive throughout the generations. But in that linear sense, in that traditional sense, with CITV gone, that's like the first big blow. And if CBBC goes in 2025, I mean, how much longer is Sky Kids going to last? Who's to say? But anyway, that's all for this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like on it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. And let me know your thoughts about all this in the comments down below. Do you think children's TV has any chance at another golden age? Or do you think all of that will be left behind in the world of linear traditional television? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. In the meantime, I've been Adam Martin from AMTV. Thank you for joining me. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you to our patrons for helping to support the show. And a special thank you to Macra, Ben Freeman, Ethan Carberry Holt, Bruce Danton, Globe of Reviews, Derek Chambers, Sean Nock, Dord Khan, Debose Crotz, Liam Domain, Carl KR, AJ Mac 200017, and Tom Bucock, our AMTV staff members.